<laughs> okay, uh, good evening, everybody. I, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's lecture, uh, the Royal Philosophical Society Adam Smith Lecture. Uh, I'm extremely pleased to welcome uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli, who's going to give us a lecture this evening. Anton is a principal and vice chancellor of Glasgow University, where our live audience is at the moment. Uh, Anton is an economist, uh, an academic, but uh, also he's particularly, his research interests are in uh, monetary economics, in fiscal policy, in international economics and macroeconomics. And Anton chairs and is a member of many committees, and I'd be giving you a whole, whole lecture if I told you what they were. Um, so he, he's also involved in, in advising the Scottish government on different aspects, including our relationship with Europe and how to try to protect that. Anton was knighted in 2017 for his services to education and economics. And uh, apparently he, in his hobbies are listed cookery and football, amongst other things. Uh, being in Glasgow, though, I, I'm not going to ask him uh, what football team he supports. Um, he's also been uh, part of an advisory group in 2020, uh, which was advising the Scottish Government on economic recovery. And that's what Antoine is going to talk to us about tonight. The title of his lecture, uh, very appropriate given that it's the Adam Smith lecture, is the health and wealth of nations, pitfalls and opportunities in the economic recovery from the pandemic. I'll just remind you that we have uh, a small live audience here in the, in the James McCoon Smith building, and we also have uh, a, a large audience uh, joining us virtually. After, when we get to the end of Antoine's lecture, uh, the virtual audience, please, as usual, enter your questions into the Q&A on the, the, the Zoom platform. Don't enter them into the chat, but into the Q&A. And I uh, will ask your questions to Anton, as many as, as we have time for. But we will also take uh, some live questions from the audience in the lecture theater. Uh, that has to be done uh, by the members of the audience who wish to ask a question using the microphone, uh, but the audience at home won't hear that too well. So Anton uh, will repeat the question for the benefit of the audience at home. Uh, Anton has to stay in the sphere of this lectern. <laughs> and if, if he goes outside it, it, I would like to say. Um, so uh, I'll hand over to Anton now for the health and wealth of nations. Thank you. Well, Pat, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and I hope everybody can hear me uh, at the back. Thank you. Um, so good evening, and, and I'm really grateful to the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow for this invitation to deliver this Adam Smith lecture. And, and thank you very much for inviting me in, in this uh, wonderful uh, lecture theater. It's the first time I've been able to lecture in the James McCune Smith building, so it's a, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, as an economist and someone who is, a, I'm, I'm myself an alumnus of the University of Glasgow, of course, Adam Smith's name and legacy is hugely uh, significant to me. Um, and indeed, as Pat has said, uh, and you've spotted the title of this lecture is a tribute to one of Glasgow's most famous alumni and professors. Um, like most lectures, let me start by setting out what I intend to cover. And uh, in fact, I think I should perhaps start by saying what this lecture is not. Let me see if my clicker works. Just, uh... Just check. 
but let me carry on. It's not what I'm not going to do tonight. Is I, it's not a lecture on health or how the trade-offs. Thank you. How the trade-offs between health and economic objectives have uh, been handled by different governments or and countries in the pandemic. Now that's a really interesting issue, of course, uh, and a matter which will continue to be hotly debated um, once the pandemic comes to an end. And indeed, public inquiries are held on how governments uh, handle the crisis. Instead, what I want to do is I want to take the COVID shock as a starting point, and I, I want to look forward. And I, of course, will highlight some cross-country evidence on the economic impact of the pandemic. One important caveat I think needs to be kept in mind when you look at cross-country evidence, which is that there are many factors which differ between countries, not least their geography, their international linkages, whether they were transport hubs, which can explain differences. It's not just all about government behaviors and what governments did, so, and how they handled the public health emergency. It's, it's a bit more complicated, as you can imagine. It also goes to say without, uh, uh, it goes without saying, public health is not my area of uh, expertise, although as an economist, I have to say, I don't think I've ever read as many papers about public health or virology as uh, in the last year. Um, but looking at the membership and indeed the council of the Royal Philosophic Society, you have many members with expertise in the life sciences. So I'm sure uh, my fellow academics in the, in the room will be better placed uh, than me to address those issues. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about macroeconomics and about economic policy choices, and particularly to illustrate the legacy of the pandemic in economic terms and how it conditions the choices that we now face as a society. Because the strain that the pandemic has put on our economies and our societies is really considerable. And its shockwaves will be felt well after this year or indeed uh, the next few years. The first key message from the lecture is that the pandemic has imposed really major fiscal shock uh, costs on society. And the cost is pretty much akin to that of a significant war. Um, not that I always want to use military analogies, but that's the kind of shock you will have seen. Um, now, again, I want to stress that I'm going to focus my attention on economic costs. But of course, the pandemic has been much bigger than that. It's imposed an immeasurable cost in terms of health, the loss of life, long-term health consequences for many millions of people across the globe has been tragic. Uh, by focusing on the economic costs alone, I by no means wish to minimize the devastating wider costs to human society caused by the pandemic. We are all acutely aware of the major losses felt by families across the world and the significant burden faced by the pandemic on our healthcare systems, which are impacting many people who have health problems beyond, beyond COVID. But by approaching this topic from an economic standpoint, I'm, I'm going to focus specifically on the major fiscal implications from COVID-19. And as I say, the reason for doing that is because it's, I think it's important to understand how this conditions our future choices, particularly because we're now in the middle of an even bigger global challenge, an existential crisis in confronting climate change. And as was emphasized by most climate experts during COP26 in this city, it's really what we do now between now and 2030 that will be crucial to the planet's survival. But more on that later, I'll mention it again at the end. Now, while the costs incurred as a result of the pandemic mean that we're starting this period of investment into hopefully saving the planet in a weaker fiscal position, there are some potential silver linings on the horizon. First, I think the pandemic has created a sense that collective action is necessary and potentially possible to tackle major global challenges. Uh, indeed, you'll have heard the mantra build back better in many government documents, whether they originate in countries like the UK or in Scotland or, or indeed elsewhere in Europe. President Biden's build back better framework and, and so on. Secondly, I think the pandemic has in many industrialized countries led to a reduction in the carbon footprint of economic activity. Uh, we were just talking about that before the lecture and, and largely through its impact on travel and, and, and move, movement of people. And this again may be seen as a platform on which we can build rather than returning to pre-pandemic norms. The second theme of this lecture is that in addition to the fiscal costs of dealing with the COVID pandemic, there's a handful of really important economic variables or forces which will influence the direction of policy and hence the choices we make as a society. And I'm gonna to touch on these tonight. One of them is around inflation and cost of living pressures, much in the news uh, these days. The other is perhaps not always in the news, but I think it's particularly important, which is around economic inequality and 
how the pandemic will play into debates about addressing this major issue in society. And finally, I want to talk about productivity growth because I think it's one of the key variables in as we go, move forward. And they're actually interlinked because on productivity growth, this has been a real problem for the UK and indeed many other advanced economies, particularly since the late 2000s. And it's an important issue for us to grapple with because again, it conditions our choices into the future. But I'm gonna just briefly touch on how long the pandemic will last because that again conditions our choices and drives uh, an important variable and un economic uncertainty. Um, from the outset, I should say that none of us have got a magic crystal ball. Uh, none of us can know how long this pandemic will last. No virologist, a public health expert can tell you that with complete certainty and certainly uh, an economist like myself can't do that. What I do want to emphasize is that, as I say, this ongoing short run uncertainty does matter because it conditions economic behavior. And it touches, I think, on the major issues which I will cover uh, in the rest of the lecture. Indeed, uncertainty, I think, impacts on how quickly investment uh, recovers and the economy therefore recovers. In turn, as I will tell you later, this will impact impacts on productivity growth. And indeed, the public investments we can then make going forward and how we will fund them. I, some of you may have seen, if you, if you are the readers of the Times, uh, and I did an opinion piece on this uh, theme of uncertainty just in the Christmas period. And as I see it, as I said in that, there are, there are three uh, phases of the COVID crisis from an economic perspective. First, we had that initial lockdown phase, of course, where pretty much we had the most severe economic impact. Most activities ceased in many countries. Um, second, we have the intermediate phase of living with the virus and the emerging variants of the virus. And third, we will hopefully have an exit and recovery phase. And I believe we're still very much firmly in that second phase of the pandemic, a kind of economic limbo, whereby we cannot enter the third phase uh, and recover our economies until we firmly extinguish the uncertainty that as the pandemic rumbles on. We'll also have to continue to invest massively. And this is a point I've made repeatedly in domestic testing and surveillance and new therapeutics. Uh, Crucially, uh, we will have to try to develop second and third generation vaccines against COVID, which provides cover against a broader range of possible variants or Sarbeco viruses. It might confer some degree, perhaps even some degree of sterilizing immunity because otherwise we simply don't know whether we will get out of, of, this, uh, of this phase. Um, and that will take time and serious investment. I think one of the risks actually, uh, although I am commenting here on health policy, one of the risks is that people will say, well, we no longer need this testing infrastructure. We no longer need this surveillance. That to me is a real risk because uncertainty can then continue. Indeed, I think we should have learned the lesson by now that there is less of a trade-off between health objectives and sustaining economic activity than some commentators suggested back in 2020 when there was big debates about lock lockdowns. Uh, I know you've had some lectures about this in, 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 in the society. And, you know, individual behavior and persistent caution and business pessimism can significantly reduce economic activity, even if they're in the absence of a government to create lockdown. You don't need formal lockdown. It's about how people behave. Now, where does this leave governments trying to manage the second phase of the pandemic? Well, in the health sphere, as I say, that needs to be this real plan to invest in a long-term strategy in the next generation of therapeutics and vaccines a global plan for vaccination. And of course, here at Glasgow University, we have uh, many experts at this area in our MRC Center for Virus Research. And we play a big role in the Lighthouse Lab in this space. Additionally, I think we need to learn how to deal with temporary disruptions if more variants like Omicron and touch wood, not more lethal than Omicron, uh, arise and which can't be covered by, by vaccine protection. There needs to be therefore more flexible support for individual sectors. Uh, finance ministries and in the major industrialized countries like the UK Treasury will generally wish to avoid generalized job protection schemes like the furlough scheme, job retention scheme, because they, as we'll show, I'll show you in a moment, they have absolutely massive costs. But to avoid major job losses and disruption, you're probably gonna have to develop more targeted and flexible interventions for highly exposed sectors. And third, given that uh, the shadow that continued long-term economic uncertainty will cast uh, 
on business investment decisions, government will need to communicate clearly. And I'm going to emphasize this, there needs to be clear communication uh, around what will be done to manage COVID-19 beyond this Omicron wave. And I'm going to show you a graph later that shows you just how badly business investment in the UK has been affected by uncertainty, actually starting with the Brexit referendum. So I'll come back to that. I wanted to show you this graph because although it is about health and not economics, uh, and we're, we are focused on economics here and on our domestic policies, I think it really highlights the importance of uh, what many people have been calling for, uh, particularly in the health sphere around global vaccination. Um, the OECD's chief economist, Lawrence Boone, recently estimated that the G20 had spent $10 trillion, $10 trillion supporting their own economies through COVID. Uh, 19, when actually $50 billion would have ensured a global vaccination program, which is an absolutely staggering figure. And if you see on this graph, uh, it basically this figure, it shows you a map of uh, using IMF uh, WHO data on vaccine supplies. And this is about secured supply. So supplies on paper contracts for two doses uh, around the world. And you'll see there's, there's light patches which are not covered, most of them, of course, in Africa and low income countries. But this figure uh, pales into significance when you actually look at what might actually happen in practice. So this figure shows you, as opposed to supplies on paper, what delays may actually happen. And what it shows you is, is effectively many of these paper contracts are actually already at risk. And many of the countries highlighted in red or yellow probably will not receive vaccine supplies, adequate vaccine supplies, well into 2022, which is uh, really a disaster in terms of managing the pandemic at a global level. But turning back to the economy, what this graph shows is just how significant the economic impact of COVID has been. It's been the biggest drop in GDP in the UK and in many other countries, really in modern times, really since modern industrial times. Um, in essence, although we've now recovered, and what these graphs, those dotted lines show is that we've, uh, these, some of these, these are forecasts, and, uh, and we've now moved, of course, into 2022, and you'll have heard in the news, we've now recovered in some countries our pre-pandemic level of GDP. A number of countries have passed that bit now. But actually, even though we might then resume growth, what's happening is that we've permanently lost where we might have been had there not been a pandemic. So actually, we are net permanently poor as a result of this. We can match the growth rate possibly that we were expecting prior to the pandemic, but you're not going to quite recover at the level that you would have been at had there not been a pandemic. The experience uh, of the pandemic has varied, as I said, by country. Um, in most cases, as I said, it's been very significant. This graph shows you what's happened to GDP and employment, the red and the green bars, and the blue graphs, uh, blue lines are bars are what's been happening to hours work. And you see that some countries have fared reasonably well uh, during the pandemic. Uh, Denmark and Sweden are at that end uh, on the left-hand side uh, as you look at it. Now, as I said, you've got to be very careful to say that this has got to do all with policies. For instance, Denmark uh, avoided, if I just take one of the examples of the countries on the left, they avoided a full third wave by implementing very restrictive measures at the outset. A very they had a very high vaccination percentage. They used vaccine passports very effectively and they then reopened the economy very quickly afterwards. Now, would that have worked in other countries? You can't tell the reality because you know every country differs by geography, by initial conditions. So you've got to be very, very careful. Those countries that experienced the bigger shocks faced uh, had to then implement really serious furlough type schemes to protect jobs. They had to cut taxes to make sure that businesses stayed in, 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 in operation. And that fiscal, effort has been absolutely huge. This graph comes, it sort of shows as a percentage of GDP, what the fiscal effort has been across a number of countries, with AE being the total for the advanced economies. These are, this is a graph for the advanced economies. I could have shown you a graph for the uh, low and middle income economies, which should have shown actually a, a smaller fiscal effort simply because they, can't, they couldn't afford to put in place quite the same fiscal effort. What you'll see is that some of them had less of a fiscal effort. You see countries like Denmark and, and, and Sweden that had less of an impact, so they had to do less. But on the right, you'll see some countries, large countries, most of them, although there's a couple of uh, smaller countries there too, Singapore and New Zealand are towards the, uh, the right of the graph, 
and they actually implemented some pretty radical uh, um, uh, spending plans and tax cutting plans. Um, it's the dark bars that are real spending. Uh, the light blue bars, which look quite big in some cases, are actually more like loan guarantees. So this is governments helping uh, businesses to say, well, we'll guarantee some of the loans that you've taken out. If you can't afford them, we'll come in and help you. Not all of them have been exercised. In fact, some of these big light blue bars won't probably cost those countries as much as they look. Some of them look absolutely enormous. But uh, for many countries, uh, you know, if you take the USA, the UK, the effort was around 15% of GDP. And this is spending, as I said, along the lines of what you would see in a, in a world war. If you look at World War II, uh, UK public defi deficit spending, I think, peaked around 25% of GDP. So it gives you an idea. It's, it's the sort of thing you would probably only spend at that, those sorts of times. And I'm not showing you a graph on indebtedness, but if you were to look at the UK's net debt to GDP, what this shock has done is it's pushed us net, our net debt to GDP back to what it was in the early 60s when we were still repaying the effects of the Second World War. Similar in other countries, the Eurozone is now looking at how it manages fiscal policy. Some of you will know that the Eurozone has something called the Stability and Growth Pact, where they, have, they tend to have, they try to encourage countries to have a, a limit to their debt to GDP ceiling. Not all of them have met it at around 60%. That's now seen as impossible. Most of the countries involved in the Eurozone have debt to GDP levels above that. I think Germany, which started at a very low level, probably is one of the ones that's still within the limit, but the others are well above that limit. And it does condition future choices for fiscal policy. As I said, starting with a much higher level of indebtedness means that we need to think much more actively about how we pay for that infrastructure investment that we need to make for net zero, health, education. You need to pay that probably more through current taxes as opposed to borrowing and through future taxes and mortgage in the future. Had it not been for COVID, had it not been for the great financial crisis back in 2007, eight, and had we had lower levels of debt, we might have had easier choices. But I think there is no free lunch, I think, for us in the 2020s. Um, we'll have to make substantial investments simply to survive the climate change challenge. And we must, but we must have a debate about how we're going to pay for this because we can't simply say, well, it will be paid for in the future. We need to develop, and this is one of my key messages today, we need to develop a fair and progressive tax system. And I'm going to come back to that later. At this time, I wanted to talk a bit about monetary policy because during the COVID crisis, as happened during the great financial crisis, many major economies and their central banks particularly have used monetary policy as well as fiscal policy to support the fiscal policies called so-called quantitative easing or QE for short. Now, this is a very busy chart. All I want you to get from this is that just to see just how active it shows you the, the sort of size of the spike shows just how active central banks have been in supporting our economies since the, since the COVID crisis, even bigger spikes than we saw back in 2007-9. So compared to even the great financial crisis, this has been a, a period when central banks have stepped in to help governments fund uh, their, their deficits. Now, what is QE? Um, I could give you a whole lecture about QE and I won't. Uh, basically, it involves central banks buying assets, mostly government debt, but in some cases, high quality private debt to keep the cost of borrowing low, it helps the costs of funding government, as well as protecting consumers and businesses from very high and volatile interest rates. What it does, and that's what that red line on that graph shows you, is it expands the money supply uh, as the balance sheet of the central bank expands. So the total stock of QE in the US, Eurozone, Japan, and the UK, which is what this graph is capturing, is risen sharply relative to the size of our economies the size of the central bank's balance sheet. So QE is money creation of a sort, but it is temporary. And it's not quite like printing money in the style of the hyperinflations that we saw during interwar Germany or Zimbabwe or Venezuela or other examples you might have read about economies in crisis. Providing that the bank retains control of what happens when the government debt matures and they don't just keep on doing this. If they manage as it matures, it says to government, back to you, it's now you have to fund this 
And the issue is how you unwind QE, how you do you unwind this approach. And that's what's happening now as central banks are worrying about how to return uh, to full activity as the economies return to full activity, how to control inflation. And that neatly takes us to inflation because the danger is, as you, uh, uh, is that as activity recovers, we see prices rising. Um, and we are seeing inflation at unprecedented levels, particularly um, in the UK, US and the Eurozone, as can be seen from this graph. In fact, just last week, the Office for National Statistics reported the UK's consumer price index uh, rose to 5.4%, and that's the one with uh, called CPI as opposed to CPIH. And there's a slight difference, there's many indices that you can measure this by. The last time inflation was this high in the UK was uh, in March, 1992 when it was 7.1%, and, and the rate continues to be well above the Bank of England's 2% target. So the question all of us, all, well, many of us are, as, as economists are asking is whether, is this, this inflation temporary? Is it transitory or is it persistent? And central banks uh, have all hinted just how difficult the choices are that they have to make now. So at the end of last year, calendar year, uh, Jay Powell, the chair of the US Federal Reserve says that they have to taper the QE uh, that they've been doing. They need to rise, uh, raise interest rates. The Bank of England has also said uh, things in this in direction. Hugh Pill, its new chief economist, said that, uh, the, and I'm quoting now, the conditions now existed for him to vote for higher interest rates. And perhaps only the European Central Bank's chief, uh, Christine Lagarde, has stuck to, struck a more dovish note, saying it's unlikely that the ECB will increase interest rates in 2022 despite the fact that their inflation is above their, their target. So the question is, how significant is the shock and what are its causes? Now, just to see from this graph, just in historical perspective, the blip I showed you in the previous one actually is much, much smaller than what we experienced back in the 70s and 80s when we had the big oil price shocks and inflation was surging all across the world, and particularly in some economies like, like our own. Um, but as I said, compared to uh, the current inflation increase to the, what happened in the 2000s, this is one of the biggest shocks in the, uh, since the Bank of England became independent uh, from government and, the, and indeed the independent European Central Bank was set up as well. Now, the inflation surge wasn't unexpected and a number of economists had said this would happen. And the causes of the shock are, is, is, uh, are multiple. First, there have been major uh, supply chain bottlenecks. The initial lockdown in 2020 caused the slowdown in production in key areas, key input areas. One obvious example, which is much cited, is microchip and electronic components. Actually, production was ceased uh, across many factories. And as a result, there was a knock-on effect on the cost of this key input. The consumer goods, such as, as various as mobile phones, as computers, motor vehicles, there are still big lags, as you know, in, uh, in if you order a car now, or if you order a computer, you want a particular model or a mobile phone, you can't always get it uh, immediately. Second, or generally, uh, global supply and transport chains were already strained prior to the pandemic. Most businesses over the years developed a highly efficient production model, which rely on just-in-time ordering of inputs, relying on last-minute purchases triggered by demand signals. And we saw the impact, in fact, of this early on in the pandemic when we couldn't get PPE because you get a surge of demand unexpectedly and the supply chain can't cope. Um, and as consumer demand recovered during 2021, there wasn't just PPE or lateral flow tests, it was everything that was affected. And this graph shows you just how significant this is. This is for the Eurozone. And it shows you that uh, comparing what's happening now at the end of 2021 rather, compared to what normally happened in terms of shortages in different sectors in the Eurozone between 2015 and 2019. You know, mostly you will see in, in a survey of companies, you'd see about 10% of them reporting shortages. Now we're seeing, you know, in areas like motor vehicle manufacture, 80% of the companies experience shortages. And even in food and beverage, which is much where the supply chains are much shorter, you know, 20% are experiencing shortages of, of this type. The third factor is around labor markets. Labor markets are tight in a number of economies, not everywhere, but in a number of economies, and that puts pressure on wage costs. Jobs were, of course, protected, as I said, by government schemes, uh, furlough type schemes, job protection schemes, 
But we also had some interesting other effects in the US and UK and some other countries. Um, there was a reduction in, in participation, job market participation through early retirement. A number of people decided to retire. You see that in the figures. Um, so you saw people um, in economies that rely on temporary migration, particularly in Europe, not just the UK actually relies on a lot of temporary migration in key sectors like food, transport, construction, hospitality. Even the Northern European economies experience this. And of course that stopped during the pandemic, creating shortages as well. So these are sort of three, three areas where there was a, a big impact. And then of course, energy prices, again, due to uh, the fact that uh, Europe started off this winter with very low um, supply, shock, uh, supply um, storage of uh, gas. We've seen big spikes in energy prices due to uh, particular conditions uh, like that. So overall inflationary pressures are proving much stronger, much more persistent than expected a few months ago. Now, I think most economists, and I put myself on that, is probably expected that you would, you'll see fading of these inflationary shocks in 2023, providing, however, that key bottlenecks cease and capacity expands. But there are caveats. That prediction could well be wrong. If, for instance, there's more supply disruptions because there's more Omicron type variants causing shutdowns across the world. And this is one of the problems that the shutdowns are not harmonized across the world. They're, they're hitting different parts of the supply chain at different points. And of course, then you have, of course, other geopolitical crises like the crisis in Ukraine and the model with, uh, at the moment, which also adds to the, to the threat in areas like energy prices. So the question is, how should uh, monetary policy respond um, for central banks, the key question is this, actually, it's not what's happening to actual inflation. For central banks, the key question is to do with inflation expectations, because if consumers and businesses um, um, sort of, if consumers and businesses believe that inflation will continue at similarly high levels as they did in the 70s and 80s, so if they think, oh gosh, this spike will continue, they will then try to incorporate it into their, way they said, their prices, or into wage claims, and inflation will then become more persistent. One difference between the 70s and 80s and now is that actually labor markets are more flexible. Uh, in most part of the private sector and many advanced economies, actually trade unions have less wage bargaining power than they had. And there's much more, for companies, there's much more international competition as a result of globalization. So rather than setting off a wage price spiral, rising prices might simply be absorbed temporarily by both profits and wages falling in real terms, meaning that it would rise by less than inflation and then the shock disappears and then they catch up over time. The way to look at it is that there, if there's a kick, maybe that's a wrong analogy these days, you shouldn't talk about kicks, but if you think of a kick, you, the shock is basically taking away one slice of the cake and as everybody's fighting over that cake and setting prices and wages, um, that can actually cause the inflation, but if there isn't a, a fight that emerges over the cake and it passes, then eventually the bit of the slice that's missing gets put back as prices subside in energy and prices and elsewhere. But as I said, that depends on COVID shocks, supply disruptions being temporary and not recurring. And if more of these happen in the future, then that's problematic for central banks. Um, so I think the key to gauging as to whether inflation remains transitory will be seen in future labor market and expectations data. And that's what central banks are looking for at the moment. And they'll look at how these evolve between now and mid 2022. If inflation takes root because wage uh, and prices, wages and prices continue to rise as a spiral, then you will see interest rates rising because interest rates now are unnaturally low given the levels of inflation that we have central banks would have very little alternative. And the danger is, of course, is that you're then back in some of the scenarios that we saw last saw in the 70s or early 80s. Because inflation is high, you then have to raise interest rates to try and get the inflation down. And that, of course, depresses output and creates, potentially creates recessions, actually, to try and manage inflation, which is, which is problematic. Now, the issue um, of inflation and its unequal effects on society, I think, takes us very neatly into the issue of how we ensure that the recovery from COVID um, doesn't increase inequalities in society. And 
I'm going to talk about inequality. And again, I want to stress I'm talking about economic inequality. So inequality in areas like income and, and wealth. There are, of course, many other inequalities that you can measure. And there's inequalities in the health domain, which I'm more qualified to talk about. There's from some fantastic research that's being done at the moment, including in, in, in my own university, including understanding the impact of long COVID. Um, and these are just as important, of course. And of course, I can't give you a, a lecture on economic inequality in a few minutes. Um, back in 2014, I was asked to, uh, this is the Adam Smith lecture. Back in 2014, I was asked to give the David Hume Institute presidential lecture. Um, and what I did there is I was highlighting back in 2014, just how even before COVID, in the shadow of the great financial crisis, we were dealing with really severe issues in inequality, which needed to be addressed. And one of my key conclusions then is that we really needed to overhaul the tax and benefit system to create more fairness in society. And I think it's arguably that many of those things that I was talking about then in 2014 in that David Hume lecture actually have been the proximate cause for other crises in economics and politics. I argued back in 2017 when I gave a, a talk uh, about Brexit, which I think is still uh, on YouTube, but it was in the Butte Hall, that really I think what happened to stagnating real wages and inequality was probably one of the drivers of the Brexit vote back in uh, 2016. And I think it's important to know that when you look at measures of income inequality, there's some real lessons to learn here. Now, not all of this happened in the, in the 2000s. A lot of this actually predates the great financial crisis. If you look at inequality, where things began to turn and become, we, we started getting increasing inequality, it was actually in the mid 1980s, after a period between 1945 the post-war period in the mid 80s when actually inequality, economic inequality, was generally decreasing in most countries. And inequality, and this is another important point, is not uh, confined to a few uh, industrialized countries. If you look at OECD data, you see that actually inequality rose between 1985 and 2008, not just in countries like the USA and the UK where we talk a lot about it, but also in many other countries. Um, and although inequality is less marked in some countries like Scandinavia, which have more pro progressive taxation system, actually, they've only moderated and not reversed the trend. Even in these countries, we've seen an increase in inequality. So as a result of this, as a result of this trend, I think there's been quite a few radical proposals. That, um, many of you may have read Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century. And he was looking at, again, a, Broad, broad historical sweep of inequality, increasing inequality. Again, marking the same trends that things changed around 1980 after a period of greater, uh, of, of lesser inequality in both income and wealth. However, as I argued in my David Hume lecture, there are many forces at play here. Thomas Piketty was arguing mainly that it's to do with the taxation of capital and the fact that we're not able to tax capital. But I think there are more, it's a much more complicated story than simply a return on capital story. So let me make a few points. First, I don't think this is just a story about uh, the super rich uh, or the top 1% or indeed the top 0.1%. Uh, recently, a Swedish economist, uh, Daniel Waldenstrom, um, paper in 2021, revised Piketty's data. And actually he was emphasizing that there'd been a shift to the situation where private health wealth was mainly held by the wealthy to a situation where it's mainly owned actually by the middle class. So actually two interesting graphs here. The one on the one on the right, as you look at it, um, is showing you that if you look at the top 1%, yes, there's a bit of a problem in the US. I mean, there's clearly some signs that in the US, the, the, the top 1% are getting wealthier. If you look at many European countries, it's more of a story, it's less of a story of the top 1%. Things have not been getting better. There's, there's an uptick there too. But actually what's been happening, what's been driving inequality in many European countries, including the UK, is to do with middle class wealth, actually as much as it is to do with the top, the top 1%. So it's to do with things like housing, it's to do with things like savings. And, and this would explain uh, you know, uh, the, what the different dynamics is in Europe compared to the US. Um, and they also question, you know, the, the, I think this data is particularly interesting because I think it questions also Piketty's idea that it's, you know, it's all to do with one or two variables. I think, and I said that in 2014, I'm gonna reiterate it now, that 
I think it's about uh, understanding all the variables here. Um, it's not just about taxation, it's also about trying to get some of the fundamentals in terms of our economic structures that are going to improve the uh, incomes and wealth of the poorer parts of society. So that takes me to a further point. Instead of just focusing on the symptoms of inequality, we, as I say, we have to understand its fundamental causes and we have to act on these. Um, there's a really interesting book uh, and quite a lot of big literature that's been built on this, written by Harvard economist Claudia Goldin and uh, Lawrence Katz in the 1980s. And they argued that one of the biggest drivers in greater inequality in the US after the mid 80s was actually the slowing down of the mass upskilling of the US population. They're saying that you know, mass universal, free universal secondary education in the US had delivered greater equality. And that could be seen in other countries too. But of course, then it had halted. And, and of course, access to tertiary education um, is pretty expensive in the US. It's not free. Uh, it's not generally free. And they were arguing this was one of the biggest drivers to, of, of inequality. And their story is essentially that as technology progresses in society, Technological process is what they call skills biased. In other words, what it does is it increases the returns to those who have higher skills. So actually, if you make education expensive, if you don't provide free public education, then what you're going to do is actually you're going to bias returns, you're going to bias things towards the incomes of the richest part of society. And this is one of the biggest drivers, they argue, that skills biased technological change is something which has been driving inequality. There are, of course, other effects. It's not just about the, the, the Goldin and Katz effect. Um, the other thing that uh, that is uh, that certainly 21st century technology is, is showing is that certain models of growth of businesses are highly scalable. Um, it's much easier in the 21st century to, for a small number of corporations to grab a much bigger share of the total market, the Googles, the Amazons, etc. Um, and this trend is particularly insidious because of what it means is that these large companies can shift profits around the world. So we've seen some of that being discussed um, at OECD level. And in fact, countries are beginning to act, you might say too slowly, they should have acted many years ago on trying to stop this transfer of profits so that capital profits can be taxed as well as laboring. There are other explanations cited for rising inequalities, uh, and that relates to economic globalization. In recent years, economists like Gene Grossman and Alhan uh, Heltman have highlighted that although trade benefits uh, an economy as a whole, and Adam Smith would of course emphasize this very point in those wealth of nations, there are also heterogeneous effects. There are major distributional effects. Now, not all these things are bad. Um, some of you may have seen uh, Branko Milanovic's famous book, uh, recent book rather, um, Capitalism Alone. And he's got this famous graph, which looks like the tusk of an elephant, which is basically showing you that actually globalization has lifted millions, billions possibly out of poverty in, uh, in the developing world, in, in low income. But the price for that has been actually that incomes have been squeezed for the lower skilled workers in countries in many advanced industrialized countries. And this has probably driven greater protectionism and populism in countries like that. So, um, what needs to be understood, I think, to, to summarize this point around inequality, what needs to be understood that is there is no silver bullet to address growing inequality. It's a problem which has multiple causes and needs multiple cures. Certainly progressive taxation can help as part of any solution. Countries moving towards more progressive systems can help. Above all, as in climate change, we're not going to address these issues at the individual national level. We need greater collaboration, as we've seen recently with the minimum tax agreement signed between a number of OECD countries. And also with skills bias technological change, we need to invest in education, public education, as widely as possible. This is something which clearly does benefit those with lower skills who have went to the labor market with lower skills, particularly if technological process continues. So more can and should be done by targeting spending on public goods, which benefit building social capital. For example, targeting investment in early years education, increasing childcare support to those who cannot afford to pay for it, tackling health inequalities in early years, fully integrating the 
This is something that infuriates me. Uh, fully integrating the benefit social security payments and taxation system. We keep thinking the national insurance and, and other taxes should be handled separately in many countries. And actually, national insurance is a tax on employment. You should integrate those systems to make sure that you're handling the, the, the whole spectrum of uh, progressivity across income uh, levels uh, well. You need to also incentivize wealth redistribution through perhaps a greater inheritance tax breaks for donations to charity to try and spread wealth. So as I say, it's not simply a top 1% issue. Now, I think many of these interventions don't fall foul of the usual criticism against higher taxes that are about disincentivizing entrepreneurship and risk-taking and overall economic growth. It's about trying to create public goods that really do matter. So, and I, as I say, I think we do need collective action. Now, as I've just explained, we had inequality before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has made some of these things worse. And there have been a number of studies on the economic inequality effects of the pandemic. Um, and let me just briefly summarize. I'm not gonna go through this in detail because I'm, I'm running out of time and I do want to give a time for questions. But um, there's a really good study which Richard Blondell and colleagues at UCL and the Institute for Fiscal Studies have done with the Nuffield Foundation back in 2020. And they, and they looked at a number of effects of, um, of, uh, of uh, inequality and what they were saying uh, of the pandemic. And the sort of things they were talking about is how uh, it's had a really severe effect, both around gender lines, ethnicity lines, and indeed on different socioeconomic groups. And really, if we're serious about this, we need to make a, a number of interventions. And the kind of things that Richard uh, and his colleagues have highlighted in terms of, are actually similar to the sort of things I was talking about a moment ago, and which were present even before the pandemic. So you need to reduce the cost of employing people using the tax system. You need to raise public service expenditure and public sector employment. You need to increase funding of retraining programs and welfare reforms have to lessen the conditionality element, boosting out of work benefits and in introducing more social insurance into the welfare system. And this has to be paid for naturally through, through taxation. Very briefly, I want to, before moving to conclude, I want to turn to the major issue of productivity growth and why it's absolutely critical that we address this. Now, what do we mean by productivity? Productivity is the amount that an economy can produce with a given number of inputs, labor, physical capital, raw materials, other inputs. And productivity really matters hugely in the context of the post-COVID recovery because what this graph shows you for the UK is that things have really not been good since 2008, since the great financial crisis. Instead of keeping on that trend line that is the line going upwards, we have a big gap shown by the yellow and the blue bars and some small red bars there. Um, and it's a really big issue because actually had the economy continued to grow along that line, um, the UK economy would have been about 300 billion larger today, which basically means around 11 and a half thousand pounds for each household in the UK. So when you're dealing with issues of inequality, you can see that you have a much bigger cake to deal with there. Um, now, again, understanding all of the economics of productivity will require a whole series of lectures, not just a, a bit of one. But we, there are some interesting things happening here in this sphere in the UK. The UKRI has invested in the Productivity Institute to get to the bottom of some of the factors here. I'm pleased that the um, University of Glasgow is involved in this. In fact, I'm pleased to be, have been asked to be part of the TPI's Productivity Commission to, to, to think about these issues and look at what policies could be adopted. A lot of the drivers of productivity is to do with the yellow bars, which is the bits that we, we can't measure. It's called so-called multi-factor productivity growth is not to do with the blue bits to do with less investment. And we'll come back to that in a moment. The yellow bit is to do with the things that are missing. And it can involve things like improvements in business processes, technological improvements, not permeating the whole of, uh, of business, lack of management quality, it can also uh, be, you know, to do with the quality of capital and machinery. Um, I won't show this graph in detail. The UK is the worst performer since, so it's not just it's not just a UK problem, as I say, but the UK is one of the worst um, um, sort of patients in this particular productivity malaise. And one of the things I did want to emphasize is that actually what's happened since the Brexit referendum is is relevant here because. What you see is the great financial crisis really did 
impact on this graph shows UK business investment index um, to the beginning of the, the sample. But uh, essentially, it shows that the great financial crisis hit it quite hard. It then recovered, but actually, not just the pandemic has had an effect. Before the pandemic, after the Brexit referendum, it's essentially flatlined. So it's been one of the things that's consolidated the problem. And you know, productivity is the key source of economic growth and competitiveness because it's to do with efficiency of production. It's to do with a given set of inputs, how much are you able to produce? Now, I know there's issues here related to climate change, by the way, and, um, but, and there's a huge literature I could spend the whole hour talking about how you can actually see increasing productivity and, and maintain economic growth whilst having less energy intensity and carbon intensities. So it actually matters because as we're trying to make more substantial uh, investments in decarbonizing the economy, we're addressing the increased investments in health or social care, and indeed addressing inequality. If you don't have productivity growth, you're gonna to have to do it through pure redistribution. Some people are gonna to have to be worse off, net worse off in level terms. And that's a more difficult sell to democratic society. So this is one of the reasons why in terms of achieving a just transition, and transition to net zero, we do need to drive um, productivity. And I was asked to write a report for Scottish government back in 2019 to look at how you could, you know, certainly innovation policy could be tweaked and changed to try and drive more into that yellow, those yellow bars, that multi-factor productivity growth. I won't go into the details of that at the moment, but there are a number of things that could be done, uh, you know, you know, including funding more postgraduate study, again, looking at public funding for that to try and address some of the inequality of access to postgraduate uh, courses. And because that improves that, it's a kind of golden and, and, and um, cats effect. It's to do with trying to address skills biased technological change and spreading the benefits of that technological change more widely. But it's also to do, and let me mention one thing in the connection to innovation. One of the big things that I do say in that report, and I would emphasize today, we need to really understand the importance of general purpose of platform technologies. One of the drivers of low productivity in the UK is to do with low levels of digital adoption. Not all, you know, certain companies do extremely well, of course, they are right up at the leading edge, but many do not adopt even what are now very common digital technologies. So when we look at the next stage of general purpose technologies, things like artificial intelligence or quantum technology, are we going to ensure that we actually are at the leading edge as a company, able to ensure that we can take advantage of these? It is general purpose technologies, whether it's electricity or many other inventions through the last two, three centuries that have made a difference in driving productivity growth. I want to finish on one point around climate policy uncertainty because I have mentioned uncertainty before in all of this. Uncertainty matters, and I said, and this has been one of my themes tonight, it matters in terms of trying to get out of the, the problems of the COVID pandemic. If we're trying to give the economy a clear steer, we need to have consistent policy. We need to have a reduction in uncertainty. And some of that is about fiscal and monetary policy management. Some of that is around giving a very clear direction of travel. And that is one of the key messages. That also matters for climate change because it's not all about public money. It's not all about the fiscal purse. This graph, which I, I think is really interesting, it comes from an OECD study. And it's basically saying, it's, it's, it's an analysis of, and this is giving the example of a, a, a median uh, carbon intensive firm and a high level, car, high carbon intensive firm. And it's saying, what difference would it make if governments had a very clear path for carbon reduction? What investments would these companies have to make in order to survive and thrive? And as you can see, I mean, basically, it could lead to an increase in investment of between seven and nine percent, depending on the type of firm, if governments get a very clear line of direction and could find a way of reducing that uncertainty in terms of direction of travel. So let me conclude. Um, the world faces an existential challenge in the 21st century, one which objectively is much more serious than COVID as we address climate change. And in the cost of the pandemic, hot on the heels of the great financial crisis of 2007-8, means that most of the world's economies are now starting this period of required investment in a much weaker fiscal position than they were. And this will require to make some, us to make some really difficult choices on how that transition to net zero is funded. 
one key point of this lecture, I think, is to hopefully to illustrate to you that the various economic challenges we face all require a sophisticated, coordinated, and a cohesive policy response. It's not about simple solutions. And in fact, I want to end by quoting Adam Smith, and he has some nice quotes in, wealth, in book four of his Wealth of Nations. He's uh, suspicious of merchants and manufacturers for what he calls their interested, interested uh, sophistry, which is all about their self-interest. But he also says, beware speculative physicians, as he calls them, who present you with very simple solutions to complex problems, like I can't resist this, leaving the EU will solve our problems. Um, but you can think of other examples. But to end on a hopefully optimistic note, uh, you know, tackling the pandemic and our recovery with the uncertainty of changes created, I think should make us think and reflect on the lessons learned. Um, as an economist, I, I really do believe very strongly that strong institutions matter for both growth and prosperity. So I've mentioned productivity. One of the things that makes a difference across countries in terms of productivity is actually institutions. And it's to do, as you might expect, in some cases with some very basic things, like the rule of law applying to all, like the defense of property rights, the ability to balance the ability of individuals to prosper in society through their enterprise, with a high degree of mutual insurance, fairness, and social cohesion. Now, Adam Smith was a political economist, and he, he would have said that the pandemic should encourage us. It should also encourage us to ensure about how the different fundamental institutions in our society are cohesive, fair, and, and resilient, because that is part of the picture. There are no simple solutions to many of these problems. And there are, beware any economist that tells you that pulling one lever will solve all your problems. And on that note, I'm going to stop. Thank you, Pat, and hopefully we can have a conversation. Thank you very much indeed, Anton. Uh, we'll have some questions. Okay. Perfect. Okay, I think uh, we'll now uh, begin now with the questions. Um, I'll ask uh, one or two of the online questions first, and then we'll take some live, and then we'll come back to the online questions. So, uh, Adam, one, one of the first online questions is, is it possible to separate out the effects of Brexit from uh, the effects of the virus uh, epidemic. Uh, the question was, is it possible to separate the effects of the coronavirus pandemic from the effects of Brexit? So that's a very good question. And um, I think it's difficult to do that in the data at the moment because the COVID effect swamps most of the Brexit effect. The main effect of Brexit, which we have noticed, as I mentioned, was to probably things like temporary migration um, flow of people um, to the flow um, of people to, in particularly those labor markets that have been impacted by COVID. But there have been one or two quite interesting studies. There was a counterfactual study which was done by the Center for EU Reform, I think, which effectively says, well, what if we hadn't had COVID? Could we calculate how much our trade with the rest of the EU would have been impacted? And they came to the conclusion that our trade with Europe is probably would have fallen by 15% if COVID had not happened. You can do you know, some of this counterfactual analysis simply by looking at the, the models for exports and imports. So we do know that Brexit has had an effect on trade. We have not felt that fully, and we won't feel that fully until we're out of the COVID crisis, but we're already feeling some of the other effects like the fact that we can't find um, drivers for HGVs, vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, you can disentangle it, but it's, it, it, I accept it's much more difficult because the COVID effects from everything. Okay, thank you. Um, a second question, how difficult do you think it would be uh, or will be to persuade governments to invest more in a global fund which invest, invest in being better prepared for future pandemics? Well, I, 
Well, yes, I, I suppose I'm, I'm slightly pessimistic. When, I, when you see those graphs of the, from the WHO, you can only be pessimistic. And when you see those figures, you know, 50 billion, which is nothing compared to what's actually been spent, could have avoided this. And, and yet we didn't do it. So what's to tell us that we can do it next time around? Look, I, I think all we can do is, is to show the evidence. I think the fact that organizations like the IMF, which uh, are, is all about fiscal prudence, actually, uh, used to be about fiscal prudence in the 70s and 80s, are actually working together with the WHO and saying, look, it's in your interest to do this. It's in your, you know, you would want to do it anyway because of, of, uh, of what bond, bonds humanity has, but this is actually in your interest to do it. And that's hopefully might be enough to make people think about more collaborative approaches to the next generation of vaccines or, or, or therapeutics or whatever. And then a question about the built environment. And a question about the built environment and the... A question about the built environment and the, the need to revamp it in order to ensure that there's fresh air inside buildings and that might require huge investment and the question is are economists modeling and planning for that i'm sure some economists are absolutely i, I it's not an area of expertise that i have at all so i can't even begin to to give you an answer uh, to how much it would cost to completely re-engineer re all our built environments um uh, I have some idea about what it would take in a university like ours. But, um, look, I think it depends how this virus evolves. You know, if, if we end up developing second and third generation vaccines that actually do suppress the virus, I suspect that problem will fade. If, if COVID actually has a long tail, then absolutely. I think that, that, that would be a serious issue. And the adaptation costs will be quite tremendously severe, I would have thought, in some areas. But... Yeah, it depends how this evolves, but not an expertise, I'm afraid. Uh, yes, and I guess there'll be a conflict uh, with preparing buildings to be more energetically efficient, which, uh, anyway, I, I now ask the audience here if anybody would like to ask a question. Can I not just take my mask off and ask a question? Because I will make my voice heard, quite simply. The question is, why, when you looked at the inflation chart and the other global effects, you never in your whole lecture mentioned China, India, and uh, even Africa didn't get much of a mention. And also, perhaps you could explain, for I'm not an economist, but you said that in one of your quotes for the disinflation was painful in the 70s and 80s. I have lived through the 70s and 80s, and this is a There were, there, there were two questions there. Do you want to repeat them? Very, very, yes, very, very happy. Uh, so it's basically, it's uh, why did I, in my lecture, touch on some of the non-advanced industrialized countries like India, China, and Africa when I talked about inflation? And the second question is really, you know, actually for those who bought property, uh, like the gentleman who asked the question in the 70s, actually, they've ended up with a massive asset, actually inflation didn't um, uh, impact on that. So let me address both. Um, the first, apologies. I, mean, I, I wanted to give you a bit of a cross-country picture and partly because I would imagine most people might be interested in what's happening here in terms of our policy choices. I was looking at comparable countries, but yes, I could have, I mean, in fact, if you look at the slides, if the slides are available online afterwards, what you can do is you can go into those databases and you'll see actually some of the, the pictures. What's happening around inflation is it's very variable around the emerging economies, low and middle income economies. Some, um, particularly South America, Latin America, Argentina, um, Venezuela are having very high inflation. Turkey is having quite high inflation. Uh, 
That's partly to do with policies. It's not just to do with the supply shock. Um, China rather less. Um, I think India is somewhere in between, but it's probably suffering from some of the uh, dislocations around transport of, of goods. So it's very variable across the world. And, and of course, one of the issues is that when you're looking at economies like Turkey, like, like emerging economies like Turkey or Latin America, they all have different institutional arrangements for central banks, that, which, which makes it more complicated to compare. Um, right. Yes, absolutely. A lot of people made a lot, can make a lot of money. You've actually made my point for me. Inflation is, is like a tax, but it does redistribute across the economy. So those people who are able to buy property and insure themselves against higher prices do rather well out of inflation. You can move out of cash. If you have a labor income which is not fixed, you can do rather well. Those who were able to buy into properties in the 70s are doing very well, which is one of the trends towards inequality that I mentioned post-1980. Unfortunately, not everybody is in the same boat. If you have a fixed income and very low bargaining power, then actually cost of living is going to put a lot of pressure. We even saw the IMF this week put pressure on the UK to say, look, uh, you should target any aid in terms of energy prices and, and, and inflation towards those on lowest incomes because they, you know, they're not able to insure themselves against that. People think inflation is painless, but it isn't painless. We know just how much of an impact it had. But you're absolutely right. It did actually benefit some people who were able to protect themselves by buying property, making perhaps some choices, investment choices. But it is very random. And it, is, uh, it does redistribute income and wealth as well, which is why in the 1990s, many governments said, look, this is not a policy that governments should drive because they don't have short-term political um, horizons. We should give, create central, independent central banks because this is all about taking a long-term perspective and trying to keep prices stable because inflation does redistribute um, and sometimes in a random way and sometimes um, actually creates more inequality. So it's a, it's a very dangerous, um, it's a very dangerous economic variable. My question is also about China. And um, I think one of the things everyone became aware of is with more sensitivity to the interconnectedness of all our economies. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could say whether um, you think this, the, there may be an opportunity that makes us become more resilient because there, I've heard reference, but I don't know where the data comes from, that there's been more reshoring um, and whether this might be something that could, um, and also if you looked at your graphs of the European zones, all the supply chain problems there, I think a lot of that, if you dug down, might become to do with the disruption from China. So, so you're absolutely right. It is to do with, and as I said, it has to do with supply chains, and a lot of it has to do, it's not just China, it's the whole of uh, it's the globalization across. Uh, a whole range of countries in terms of low cost manufacturing being offshore and therefore having very, very sort of tenuous supply lines. And you're absolutely right that many manufacturers in those sectors I showed are now rethinking about onshoring again, or at least having much shorter supply lines to avoid that. So, and that would certainly have helped. I mean, now there are two, we again, in, since no, you know, we've got to look to the future. We're not, we're not just looking at COVID. If we look at climate change, there's a really interesting debate going on at the moment because the, the World Trade Organization is looking. There are actually two types of effects. On the one hand, keeping, you know, having very long supply lines can be actually quite expensive in terms of carbon usage because you're having to move things from one side to the other and back again. But actually, uh, if trade also drives efficiency, which means you use less raw materials, which means that's good for climate change. So you don't want to return to a very inefficient model of having all your production happening in one place. So there's some interesting questions there. Again, it's more complicated than we sometimes think. Onshoring, yes, absolutely would have helped us during COVID. Will it help us necessarily during, um, in terms of tackling tight climate change or do we actually do want quite a high efficient level of production with less waste? Um, and of course, there's all sorts of things there like carbon leakage and things that we need to beware in trade. But it's a, your point is really valid in terms of COVID, and we need to look at how uh, 
we need to look at trade and the heterogeneous effects it creates, the complicated linkages, and we need to look at how we want to arrange it going forward because the next challenge is not COVID. The next challenge, as I say, is certainly climate change and who knows what else. Yeah, I'll take uh, another uh, of the online questions. We've got quite a lot, so I'm going to try to summarize them. There's a question about whether or not you'd favor moving taxation from earnings and spending towards unearned and hoarded wealth. So that's a really interesting question. And it's one that actually economists did look at in the, there was a famous report around taxation back in the 70s called the Mead Report, which was looking at the possibility of using things like wealth taxes. And uh, um, I think the problem with that is that um, wealth is mobile, a bit like capital, and therefore, unless the whole world moved to that, you would have a situation in which people would simply move their wealth around. Some wealth can be moved, but a lot of wealth can easily be moved. Liquid wealth can easily be moved. I suppose the question is more, do you want to strike more of a balance in this direction? And, and of course, you know, you could do that, and we do do that to some extent. I mean, take housing uh, taxes in the UK. They're not actually as progressive as they might be. They're not based on the value of your house. They're based on very rough bandings. All I would say is be very careful, though, that when you go into these debates, it's not often, the, it's not just about the very wealthy. Um, first of all, they are often outside any jurisdiction because, as I say, unless you can get a policy around this across the world, people will just move their wealth around. But the problem is that in order to get a, lot, a large enough base, you are going to hit a large proportion of the population. And the last thing you want to do also is to disincentivize savings. That was one of the arguments when this was debated in the 70s on wealth taxes. Well, you don't want to stop people from saving. You don't want people to encourage people just to consume uh, wealth. Actually, that's a bad policy as you're going into a world in which you're trying to manage climate change. Overconsumption is the last thing we need. Um, so um, I wouldn't favor all of that, but I would favor some, uh, some you know, selective taxation of things like housing wealth or other wealth, which, you know, at the margin, you could probably do to try and encourage some level of redistribution. So again, balance is my answer to the question. And, and still with taxation, there's a question about uh, whether we should change tax so that uh, bad activities that are damaging the climate are taxed most heavily. So that's an easy one. I think the answer is yes to that. And, and certainly, I think increasingly governments have to look at that. Um, now, again, to, it's not easy politically. I mean, you're seeing the debate at the moment, not only in the UK, but in many countries around, oh, well, could we not cut taxes on fuels, please? Because uh, prices are going up and people are being, living standards are being squeezed. It's also about, you know, you have to take into consideration, do people really have choices around some of this? And what do you do? Which again means you could probably do it by taxing bads and also ensuring that you use the welfare system to compensate those who can't afford to consume those bads. It's a really complicated question again, but generally, yes, the answer is you want to go there. You want to tax carbon more intensively, but it's easier to do so once you're starting to put in place solutions to, to carbon usage as well around public transport systems, you know, low carbon transport systems, et cetera. Um. There's also uh, a question in connection with Denmark and how Denmark managed to have such a relatively low economic impact. Can you say anything about how? Um, I realized that I've, I made a mistake by mentioning Denmark because I needed to then swat up about everything about Denmark. All I know uh, about, actually Denmark is quite interesting because there's an interesting comparison with Sweden because geographically, of course, they're very close, but they also have very different approaches to managing the pandemic, where Sweden had a more liberal approach to doing the first wave in Denmark, actually much had a stricter approach, and actually Denmark initially fared better than Sweden. I think all I can say about Denmark is that they did avoid one of the major waves, uh, and it happened to coincide with a period when vaccines were available, so they very quickly vaccinated uh, heavily. They used vaccine passports very heavily. However, I'd be very careful in trying to compare things too carefully because it may have to do, you know, it's a small population. It may have to do with how much, you know, the, that, that particular wave, the third wave they avoided was seeded in the country and whether, you know, they were able to clamp down very quickly. 
um, you know, as I say, it's not going to be easy for anybody to do a, a retrospective analysis of all this and what could have happened because no two countries were, were the same in terms of that. But I think that's basically what they did. They were very, very strong, but also they released economic activity. Well, one other thing, actually, let me give you the example of Germany, uh, because again, Germany did rather better than us in terms of economic shutdown. We shut down in this country, we shut down pretty much everything, including construction and manufacturing. Germany didn't. They said, no, that has to continue. Um, and that's interesting to, to me because again, it showed you how there was quite a different approach in different countries. And, and of course, you know, you can't identify it as a simple cause and effect from one or two measures, it was the cumulative effect. But um, the countries did all approach it rather differently. And as a result, the outcomes, but I wouldn't, were very different. I can't, you know, I can't say they did one magical thing that, except as I say, rapid restrictions, comprehensive restrictions, but also a quick release at the end. Um, there's also a couple of questions in relation to the intersection uh, between uh, Scottish independence and economic recovery. Now, that's obviously politically quite sensitive, but uh, do you want to say anything about that? I'm very happy to talk about it in neutral terms. And, and I, I mean, I've, as I've always done in these instances, given my institutional position, I've never sort of uh, um, taken a, a public position on any of this, but I'm very happy to talk about the issues at play. And, and actually, there's some really interesting, um, um, There's this week, there's a, an interesting set of publications, which is partially edited by one of our professors here, Glasgow Graham Roy in social sciences. It's a publication called the Economic Observatory, and uh, it's written in lay, in, in lay person's language. It's actually funded by the SRC as a way of communicating uh, economics, uh, economics research. It's a very good series. It's all about independence. I would encourage you to look at that. Basically, the two trade, the trade-offs, the main trade-offs here are around whether you believe that actually uh, a major radical change in our economic arrangements which would need to happen if, the, if Scotland did become independent and join, rejoin the EU, it wouldn't imply actually re-engineering all those economic links. Most of our economic links at the moment are with the rest of the UK, with the trade barriers that would appear if we did become independent and rejoin uh, the EU. You would need to be like Ireland, you would need to be much more connected with the EU in, in terms of trade linkages and economic linkages. And there's some people who would say that's a great thing and that will give us, because we'll hitch our wagon to a more rapidly growing Europe. Those who are against it are saying, well, hold on a second, if you're part of a larger country, you're able to share risks more effectively. Uh, and actually the UK will make a success of being outside the EU. And those are, you know, those are two of the issues that are at play, but I really would encourage you to have a look at the Economic Observatory. It's actually, like, it's online, freely available, great publication. It tells you what the issues are whatever side of the debate you're, you're on. Um, uh, another question, uh, partly related to uh, the climate change issue. Do you think the pandemic is an example of uh, an e a cat e ecological catastrophic limit to economic growth? Is putting the brakes on actually, in planetary terms, a good thing? A really difficult question. I. So I'm, I, I, I mean, as you'll have gathered, I'm all in the part of the, those economists who think there is a path to net zero, which involves being able to do this in a just way and in a way that doesn't effectively require society to uh, completely change what it does, because I suspect that will be difficult to sell. Uh, there will be, of course, need to be an impact on our carbon usage, but you know, most people, I mean, there was a really interesting lecture given at the University of Glasgow recently by Chris Stark of the uh, Climate Change Commission, showing that actually the kind of investments we're talking about in order to transition to net zero, around 4% of GDP per year in most of our countries, is actually doable. It is doable. Um, and that will drive, with the technologies that we already know about, could drive us towards net zero without effectively saying stop growth dead. The problem with stopping growth dead is that then we're not necessarily solving the, the climate catastrophe because as you're aware, even the current levels of, of CO2 emissions are not, 
uh, will not solve the climate problem. And therefore, how do you fund those technological uh, changes that are going to drive down uh, emissions? And secondly, the redistributive consequences are so stark that I suspect you will simply not get consensus either in our democratic societies or even in autocratic societies will you get consensus on trying to do something about climate change. So I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm in the tribe of economists who thinks that actually trying to channel new technologies and productivity growth to help the transition issue is the right answer. Um, because I think stopping everything dead doesn't actually get you there. But I know there's people with different views on this. From the online audience, because uh, we're running out of time, I'm sorry, you might be able to catch Anton uh, at the end. Um, there's a question then uh, about, um, the, the questioner is asking that as an exporter of machines, uh, he knows that the periods of return on investment in the UK and the United States are about 18 months, but in Germany, maybe three years, Japan five. Uh, why is that? Why does it take, why is it return expected to be so much faster in the UK? That's a good question. I, and, and I suspect the questioner is asking really about um, the way in which companies are managed in with much more patient capital perhaps in Germany and Japan than in the US and UK. And, and that's to do with the, the probably with the ownership of, of these companies. Um, and it's a fair it's a fair point. It may be to do it's probably to do with that. Uh, it's probably something which um, has helped countries that have more patient capital to take a long view on investment. So yeah, I would sympathize with that. And I suspect that that's what that, that's what the driving the data he's he's citing. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. I'm just going to ask you one last question. Uh, there's a question, you, you mentioned three uh, economic phases to the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, and the third one was an exit phase as a, opposed to the live with it phase. Do you think there really will be an actual distinct exit phase? Um, good question. Um, I think it depends entirely how the pandemic ends, uh, isn't, doesn't it? I mean, if vaccines end up being effective against um, further variants, if uh, the variants continue um, to be like Omicron, which is that they have, a, you know, they're less lethal to a vaccinated population, then I suspect there will be gradually an exit. Um, and there will be attention given to other things, not, not least because, and again, this is not my area of speciality, but I know from talking to many of our medical experts that there are many other health issues which have been essentially supplanted by the pandemic. And these will come to the fore. I mean, people will, will ask for a rebalancing of different harms. And we're, we're having that debate at the moment, certainly in Scotland on the health zone. So, um, so I think there will be an exit phase. However, you know, um, so also tell me we've been lucky so far because actually in many respects, um, uh, COVID, despite it, that, you know, it's been such a terrible and devastating disease, you know, we could have had a variant that was much more lethal and just as transmissible as some of the recent. So actually, you know, um, nobody can tell us whether a variant like that will emerge, in which case um, that phase three is a long, long way away. Uh, let's hope not. I'm going to touch wood as I'm saying all this. Um, I'll just ask one final question of my own, um, which is about intergenerational justice in this pandemic. A lot of economic impact and loss of opportunities has been faced by the younger generation rather than the older generation. And in terms of these lost economic and so many other opportunities, how can the economy help young people in particular? So it's a really good question. I, I wasn't able to spend as much time actually on that study by Richard Blundell and colleagues at UCL and IFS. I would encourage you to have a look at it if you have a moment. It's, written in quite non-technical languages online. And as you say, Pat, I mean, it's, there's, there, 
there are many losses that we're only beginning to measure, you know, learning loss in schools, which is not impacting equally on all children, it's impacting those children who have less parental support, who tend to come from more deprived socioeconomic groups. So it's going to embed those inequalities going forward. Given everything I was telling you about skill, you know, skills bias, technological change and all that, that's going to become even more acute in the future with those generations. The only way you deal with it is through, in terms of intergenerational fairness, is to invest in things like education. And I'm afraid that's going to have to be paid by those parts of society, which are tend to be the older generations with higher incomes and higher wealth. And I think that's one of those things that, as Richard and his colleagues emphasize, can help to level the playing field a bit. As we, as we move forward. Okay, I, I, we run out of time. I apologize for questions that Anton has not been able to answer either from the audience here or for the audience online. We just don't have enough time. Um, I should have said at the beginning that I'm, my name's Pat Monaghan. I'm the president of the society. And I just slipped off the screen a little bit to put on my presidential chain of office. <laughs> Uh, slipped into something not comfortable, I might say. Um, but I now have the pleasure of thanking Anton for a, a very interesting lecture. He took us through a lot of ground uh, about economic policies nationally, internationally, how it intersects uh, with the climate crisis that we also face. Um, and, and that was all very interesting. And thank you very much indeed. Anton for doing that for us. And what I'd like to do now is to present you with the Society's Adam Smith Medal. Thank you very much, thank you. Much, much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, you do get to keep it. Oh, so uh, that brings, uh, we're not that strapped economically, <laughs> take it back off you. Um, that brings this evening's session to an end. Uh, I'd just like to uh, say that the next lecture, which is on the 9th of February, which was to be given by Helena Kennedy, unfortunately, due to uh, meetings of parliamentarians. I can't quite think what they've got on their mind at the moment, but anyway, uh, she's not able to come to Glasgow then. And so instead, uh, we have an alternative lecture from the director of Scottish Opera, and he's going to talk to us uh, about uh, an enduring art opera in Scotland. So I hope as many people as possible will be able to join us for that. So thank you very much uh, and good night. <laughs>